He says, wow, what a great website you've got. So it starts to get out there, and people start phoning, people start talking to you. So I have two awards up here, and I'm going to ask the people involved if they would come up, and uh, there's two of these here. These are the, war the, the statues with torches, okay, which is these two. So who do we get? So the second set of awards, it recognizes outstanding work from creative professionals involved in concept, writing, and design of traditional materials and programs, and emerging technologies. And for me, that goes beyond Facebook, and it goes beyond getting into the internet, okay? International competition receiving entries from more than 35 countries worldwide, two gold awards received for the City Service app, and website launch video, and an honorable mention for the overall website design and economic development website. In other words, well done. It's probably the bottom line that should be underscored here. So I'm going to invite the two individuals, please. We have two statues with wings I'm supposed to give out. Don't fight over it, okay? It says, award glass teardrop, best looking one, front row. Someone's getting a special award. It recognizes, oh, this is a <laughs> economic development, honoring success and achievement in the areas of promotion, collaboration, and community building initiatives. There was 118 submissions from across Ontario. And the project highlights locations around Cambridge that have been used in various film projects allows user to perform self-guided tours of these locations and explore the world of film and television in Cambridge. It builds a sense of community ownership, pride and participation in industry projects. This is the best looking award, okay. Anyways, I just want to close off by saying that, uh, you know, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and I, I say it again and again, we have great staff who do good things in the city. And uh, they have very high standards. And whenever I ask for things, it's done uh, as members of council. We get things immediately done. And uh, when we get into difficult situations, they help us out of those situations in terms of keeping the course, uh, keeping us going ahead. And I just want to say once again, thank you for members of City Council and myself for what you do. It is appreciated, and uh, we don't forget you day to day, believe me. Uh, and I just want to say that uh, in all, you know, it's your excellence that makes this city run so well. So thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mayor Craig, for doing that, and I agree. We have very talented staff and all of us here. We appreciate everything that you do. Before we get into the agenda, I just noticed we have to get out of the closed session. Do I have a mover and seconder? Mover, Councilor Mann, seconder, Councilor Montero. All those in favor? And just so um, the general public knows, we just met to discuss what to do in an emergency. That's what the subject of the, the meeting was. I'm going to, uh, at, here at City Hall, I'm going to move into delegations. Devon Hogue, Business Information Officer, and Nicole Walker, GIS Analysis, Recent Awards, Filming in Cambridge, and Map Demonstration. Welcome. Mayor Craig, Council, 
<laughs> staff and members of the community. I wanted to start off by thanking you all for the opportunity to discuss our Cambridge Film Program this evening. Over the past few years, we've had some tremendous success attracting and facilitating location filming projects, and I appreciate this time to discuss our progress with you here this evening. Now, for those of you who may have missed the numerous emails and film notifications I've sent so far this year, the industry is taking a very strong interest in Cambridge. In the first quarter of 2018, we have seen a 66% increase in the number of completed projects and film inquiries are double what they were in the first quarter of 2017. Completed projects have had an estimated economic impact of $445,000 in the first quarter of 2018, which is a 262% increase over the same time frame in 2017, and approximately a 46% increase in the 2017 year-end total. Now, this is money that's invested in facade improvements and area beautification and spent renting facilities in local shops, restaurants, and hotels. Since our office begun collecting this information in January of 2016, staff have recorded an estimated economic impact of over $2.1 million for our community. Our typical film season tends to be May through October, with June to August seeing an influx of inquiries, and August through October being the busiest for facilitation of projects. This is similar to results seen by our counterparts in Durham Region, Hamilton, and Toronto. Approximately 65% of all film inquiries received relate to TV and streaming media projects, with motion pictures coming in at 14%, and documentaries, commercials, and independent projects rounding out the rest. We are aware that many independent projects do not connect with our office and are increasing our efforts to connect with the local independent filmmakers as we see our grassroots community as an area of opportunity for growth and development. And we want to be able to support and promote their projects as we do for the larger scale productions. We average approximately a 30% attraction rate for projects versus inquiries, which I feel is a fairly respectable ratio. Although in the first quarter of 2018, we're currently sitting at 50% attraction. Some of the project inquiries we receive, we just aren't able to accommodate as we do not have the assets available. For example, we received an inquiry for a futuristic building similar to the Aga Khan Museum in Toronto. Now, as we're all aware, this type of asset is not in our wheelhouse currently. In this case, we connected the location manager in question with staff from the City of Waterloo, thinking that maybe the Perimeter Institute would be a good fit, but in the end, the production was actually able to secure the Aga Khan for filming. And for anyone who's curious, this was for the Star Trek series reboot last year. Other times, we may have conflicts with construction or event schedules, or in some cases, they may just find a more appropriate fit closer to the GTA. In February, I took advantage of being in Toronto for the Economic Developers Council of Ontario Conference, and I had the distinct pleasure of meeting with staff from the Toronto Film and Television Office. Throughout our meeting, we compared processes, traded war stories, and enjoyed a frank discussion regarding the challenges we all face. I was pleased to find that our local concerns are not unique to our municipality, and that our processes align with those carried out in Toronto, which serves to encourage production companies to investigate Cambridge's filming option. The easier we can make our processes for the industry, the more successful we will be at attracting them to film locally. We have built post-mortem meetings into our processes and our feedback from the film community has been incredibly positive to date. Production companies appreciate the responsive nature of our film office and our growing ability to anticipate their needs. But we are only able to accomplish this through the many amazing staff we work at throughout our municipality and I would like to take this opportunity to thank a few divisions our traffic and parking division is integral to our success, and without their support and assistance, we would not be able to accommodate the projects we do. Our community services staff are key in minimizing the complaints regarding core area parking by allowing base camps to park in their numerous parks and facilities. Our public works division assists us with required municipal works, like signage removal on a cost recovery basis. Our GIS and communications divisions support our desire to promote the amazing things we are doing here locally. 
in addition to the numerous other departments and divisions that support our efforts on a regular basis. It takes a village to successfully facilitate location filming, and we are truly grateful to have a village here that we can count on to support our office goals and quickly adapt to ever-changing project timelines and scopes. One thing I tend to get asked very often is, why Cambridge? Well, this answer goes far beyond the amazing staff I have the privilege of working with. Cambridge is beautiful. We are fortunate to have breathtaking natural and built heritage assets. And I would encourage every one of you in Chambers tonight to go for a walk this week and appreciate what we have here. The rivers in Cambridge are integrated as important downtown features from the Speed in Preston and Hespler through the Grand River and Galt. These rivers add value to our community and are a main industry attractor. We have the amenities of a city with a small town vibe. It's part of our identity and the charm that keeps people coming back. My industry contacts often tell me how refreshing it is to work in a community that actually wants them here. We have supportive leaders throughout our community, from our internal leadership teams to our various community groups and agencies, our office enjoys a great deal of support and cooperation. We focus on customer service, but not only to the industry, our businesses and residents as well. By constantly working to find compromise and attempting to minimize the disruptions that come with these projects, we continue to build community support and keep the Cambridge competitive. We are fortunate to have had past councils dedicated to preserving the natural and built heritage in our community and a current council and community partners that prioritize infrastructure and renewal projects along our river banks. But most importantly, we have property owners that are excited to revitalize their properties and be willing partners in our downtown renewal efforts. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank our businesses and residents for their continued interest, patience, and enthusiasm when it comes to location filming, because without their support, we would not continue to enjoy our success. Our office is open to feedback, and we encourage members of the community to contact us with concerns during a project or suggestions on how we can do better. We recognize that filming can be disruptive and do our best not only to accommodate the production company, but also be considerate to residents in our business community. Those that live, work, and play here are the ones who add stability and vibrancy to our community, and we want to ensure that they feel supported should issues arise. The success of our film program belongs to every single one of us, and I believe it's something we deserve to celebrate. Now, for those of you who are interested, seasons two of uh, The Handmaid's Tale actually started in Canada on Sunday, um, and we'll be airing episodes on Bravo. The Designated Survivor series finale filmed in March, and it will be airing toward the end of May. And this Sunday, members of our community have organized a Jane's Walk based on our Handmaid's Tale story map and touring locations throughout our core area where filming has taken place. So I would encourage all of you to come out to uh, the Idea Exchange at 2 p.m. and join us on that walk. I would like to invite Nicole Walker up here to briefly explain our award-winning map and demonstrate a new initiative that we will be launching in June. In an effort to increase our profile and refresh our presence on the Ontario Media Development Corporation Digital Library, we are launching a crowdsourcing map in conjunction with our GIS department. We will be looking to the public to contribute locations that they feel are ready for their close-up, to catalog the assets we have in our community, and really celebrate Cambridge. We will be utilizing similar technology to our filming story map, but will allow users to upload their own photos of local sites used for filming and identify them on a map. More information will be released shortly. We just wanted to ensure that Council was aware of the upcoming project and is excited to promote, to promote it to the greater community as we are. So, Nicole, thank you. Good evening, committee members. The Filming in Cambridge Story Map launched August 14, 2017. To date, it has, over, it has had over 5,600 views from people exploring productions that have filmed in Cambridge. Interest in the application has remained steady with an average of 15 visits per day. 
To complement Devin Hogue's Economic Development Impact Summary, we are happy to share that this map application was built leveraging existing resources, including staff time and current software licenses of ArcGIS Online. The interactive map is easy to use on both desktop computers as well as mobile devices. The simple nature of the application makes it easy to understand and get information quickly. Sustained momentum with this project can be attributed to the ongoing engagement and promotion with both corporate communications and economic development. The Filming in Cambridge story map description and link has been included in articles by CBC Kitchener-Waterloo, CTV Kitchener, 570 News and more. The map is kept up to date as television episodes, movies, and commercials air by working together with Devin Hogue in economic development and personally watching the shows that are filmed here. You can look forward to, as Devin said, the updates in the next few weeks that will include season two of The Handmaid's Tale and or season two of The Handmaid's Tale and the season two finale of Designated Survivor. So just to go over to the <laughs> user experience, um, this is the map application that we had just won the award for. Um, and it is organized um, by television, movie, and commercial. You can navigate the map using the, the navigation tools at the top left-hand side of the window, the map window. You can also click and scroll in the map window itself and pan around. You'll notice that the map is dynamic, and the pictures to the left will change as you move around the map. It will only show the ones that are active. Um, I click on one. So each point on the map is a location for filming. Um, and each of the locations can have information such as episode information, description of the project, filming description, filming location, photo credit, and more information. Okay. Some of the movies that have been filmed in Cambridge. Uh, Flatliners had just launched, or sorry, premiered um, at the movies <laughs> um, this past winter, and they had filmed on Blackbridge Road and Blackbridge, a car chase scene. We also have um, movies such as St. Ralph that was filmed um, in 2003, and it uh, stars a Cambr uh, Adam Butcher who was born in Cambridge and it dresses up the Main Street Bridge like the 1954 Boston Marathon. If we move over to commercials, here's an example of a TD Canada Trust commercial filmed in uh, 2003. The information that I got for this was actually from one of the old City Line uh, newsletters from the city. Uh, we were looking for some retirement photos and came across this gem. Uh, so this is actually Debbie Fee, if anyone knows Debbie. Uh, and then in the television, there are many, many television product, uh, promo productions, uh, such as Murdoch Mysteries is featured heavily throughout Cambridge. We also have The Handmaid's Tale, which is also fe featured heavily, as Galt is uh, Gilead, for those who have watched the show. Uh, we also have some other productions, such as um, American Gods. They filmed an episode here. Uh, the Galt stands in for the town of Vulcan, and you'll see that they filmed on the Main Street Bridge, but they've done some CG effects in the background to make it look like an industrial town. So it's really neat to see what people have been doing. Um, and I'll just show you this one. Uh, this was filmed in 2011. It was the show Nikita, and uh, Galt uh, stood in for the city of Amsterdam. So you can see they're at a cafe and walking down the alley there. So I'm going to go over to our next project. Um, this is called uh, Capture Cambridge. So as Devin said, this is a crowdsource application that is being launched this June for a short campaign. It will be used to engage the public and ask them to help us identify where filming could take place. The goal is to amass an inventory of locations throughout Cambridge in, in, in addition to those that are already well known. The idea is that the user can take a picture, identify their location, and upload their photo to the map. This map will grow with submissions over the life of the campaign. So the user experience for this map is, it, when you launch, it will look like this, and then you can click Explore Map. And the map is similar to the Filming in Cambridge map application. It works well on a desktop computer. It's mobile friendly, easy to use, and fun. Users can explore the map in a very similar way to the Filming in Cambridge 
the zooming tools are the same, or you can click and zoom in and out. The user can view the existing submissions by clicking on a photo or a point on the map. The information included will be picture, obviously, um, the title, location, and description. To participate in this project, the user would click the Share Your Photo button and sorry, the form will pop up. Here's where you can click and drag and drop or click to pick a file. So if I click here to pick a file, we've loaded one. City Hall, open. It's not the right size, but we can use it. No, we can't, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, you'd enter a title and the location. So for the location, you can either use uh, Locate Me if you have GPS enabled on your mobile device. You can search by an address and it's uh, dynamic and it will find that for you. Or you can click and place a point on the map. In the description, we're asking people to enter in their website or uh, name if they'd like credit for the, for the photo and also to provide a short description of the location. They must accept the terms and conditions outlined here uh, the terms and conditions have been provided by the City of Cambridge uh, Legal Department. And once they've accepted that, they can click Submit. The photos from this campaign will be reviewed by Devon Hogue for approval prior to posting online. So we do have a vetting process just to ensure that we're, we're showing appropriate content. Um, and at the end of the campaign, the photos and or locations chosen by an economic development from this application will be used for our next project, which details will be coming soon. Thank you for your time and the opportunity to share our accomplishments with you tonight. Thank you. Any questions, Councillor Devine? Yes, thank you. Uh, Devin and Nicole, uh, great presentations. Devin, you did a fantastic job. And it, you have taken to this position like a duck to water. You do a great job, and you work well with your colleagues. The whole department just does a fantastic job. Um, and the information you just gave us, it was, it was great. So keep up the good work, too. Keep up the good work. You're doing a great job. Thanks. Councillor Leggett. Through you, Mr. Chair, echoing on what Councillor Devine has said, um, I had the opportunity to see you full form, Devin, at a, at a, outside of here doing a, a fantastic rep, uh, presentation representing the city at a conference, and you did a wonderful job. But the map, did you not have a map there, or was that another presenter of the Toronto area and then the, the radius coming out and how it is that we are so lucky to get so many films and the reasons why? Do you have that map with you, or if you don't, can you explain all of that? Uh, through, to, through the chair to Councillor Liggett, um, that was actually not me who had that map. It was uh, the location manager who did the uh, lunchtime um, discussion. Um, but I did get him to forward that to me, and I can forward that to council as well after this presentation. Could you explain that, though, what it is, please? Okay. Um, so what it is is there are certain tax credits that are available um, if you film outside of the Toronto area um, for a certain percentage of your <coughs> um, days outside of studio. Um, so the map in question just highlighted that um, Cambridge is in an area where um, it's advantageous for them to film on location. Thanks. <clears throat> Councillor Mann. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you, thanks very much for the presentation. My question is, uh, who are the people involved in this? I, I know that uh, you, are, you are leading this, Devin. Who else is on your team? For the map or filming in, in general? In filming in general. Filming in general, I think I kind of highlighted a lot of the departments. Um, film has a way of touching every single department within the municipality. Thanks. And I, I think you spearhead that. And I think uh, you're, you take the lead role in that. And uh, you talked about uh, people making a difference. And I think, uh, as the mayor said earlier uh, this evening in his presentation, that we have great people in our organization, and you really do make a difference. And I know you have a team of people that you're working with, but you have made a, an incredible difference to our city, putting it on a map, on the map in a different way. 
and bringing attention to our community like never before. My only concern is that one day I'm afraid that you're going to end up in the movies and we're going to have a vacancy to fill. But uh, congratulations for the work that you do and it's very special work and, and it really is uh, uh, amazing to see where we have come over a short period of time because of the work that you and your team have done. Thank you and congratulations. Councilor Montero. Uh, thank you. Through the chair, I have uh, no questions, but I have observed you in action, Devin, and all your office there, economic development, every time I walk there, you guys are always in a good mood. you like you're living the dream. And uh, I've seen you in action outside. In fact, I've taken pictures through my window of you down below. Uh, I think you, 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 the whole office is doing a fantastic job. And while we were working in our area, I got to know you, but this is the fit for you was economic development and doing what you're doing. I thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor uh, Leggett. Through you again, Mr. Chair. Um, I think we all know basically what Devin does, but Nicole, <laughs> you're up there doing presentations, so can you tell me what role you, I'm sure it's very significant, so can you explain what part you play in all of this? please um, sure so uh, I had a meeting with Devin and she said this is kind of what, what we're looking for and we had just started working with some newer software and said hey this looks like it could be fun maybe it would be a great vehicle to show off the filming locations in Cambridge so working with Devin um, to develop the content for the application uh, I set it up and I maintain it and uh, I promote it on my personal social media because I'm really excited about it. Um, I watch the shows. Some of the pictures are mine. Um, that's pretty much it. <laughs> Thank you. I have no further speakers. On behalf of the committee, just want to applaud you for all your hard work. It's paying huge economic dividends, and we're becoming Hollywood North, so well done. Brian Geertz, Manager of Operations, Forestry, Horticulture, and Glenn Prevost, University of Toronto. Other business regarding um, the, the Victoria Park Woodlot Management Plan, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. To you, Mr. Chair and members of committee, I just wanted to take a moment to introduce Glenn Prevo. I had the opportunity to really get to know Glenn last year through a, a unique partnership that we set up with the University of Toronto. It's often that uh, we look to consultants or, or another avenue to get professional advice on something, but a unique opportunity came up to work with master's uh, students. So we partnered with the university and Glenn's uh, master's work and thesis is the results in a new forest management plan for Victoria Park. And it's all part of a, our larger uh, toolbox that we have for urban forestry, starting with the canopy study in 2014 the urban forest plan of 2015 and the resulting tools that we've developed since then. And annually we continue to develop and, and manage the forests across the city. And we're excited to present the first forest management plan we have for the city. And Glenn will do the pre present presentation. Thank you. Hello. My name is Glenn Prevo, and as Brian mentioned, I'm a recent graduate of the Master of Forest Conservation Program at the University of Toronto. Thank you for having me in to talk about the, urban, the Victoria Park Urban Forest Management Plan. Over the past 12 months, I've developed this management plan for Victoria Park. Oh, yeah, Okay. Um, as Brian mentioned, this was a partnership between the city, the University of Toronto, and the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. The Victoria Park woodlot has been identified as an important urban woodlot by the City of Cambridge and the Region of Waterloo. Regionally, it's been designated as environmentally sensitive policy area and is heavily used by the public. It's 11 hectares in size and the city maintains official trails throughout. Surrounded by residential housing and Highland Public School, it is used by many people for walking, nature enjoyment, running, biking, and for education. 
The forest canopy is dominated by red oak, and red oak forests are rare in Ontario. Historically, the woodlot held many rare plants. There has never been a management plan for this woodlot, and city staff pursued this project because it would help contribute to meeting the city's goals related to urban forest management. The city's urban forest canopy study identified Victoria, the Victoria Park Highlands, of which the Victoria Park woodlot is a part, as having the highest canopy cover in the city at 45%. The woodlot itself is even higher at 84%. The woodlot management plan helps to protect what we value and what we already have. The urban forest management plan identifies woodlot plant inventories as a priority. An accurate plant inventory is the basis for any good woodlot management plan, and this was completed as part of this project. The management plan was developed based on the objectives of the city for the woodlot. These are one, to ensure the ecological health of the woodlot, and two, to maintain facilities for passive recreational use. The woodlot was donated to the town of Galt in approximately 1900 by Langdon Wilkes, with the requirement that it be maintained as a park free for all to use. A deer enclosure with many deer was installed in the park and maintained for several decades from at least the early 1940s to approximately 1975. In 1980, an exercise circuit, including equipment, was installed, but this is no longer maintained. Currently, there are one and a half kilometers of official trail throughout the woodlot and almost two kilometers of unofficial user-built trails. These past uses, especially the deer, combined with today's heavy unofficial trail building and use, have resulted in considerable disturbance and degradation to the woodlot. As I mentioned, a detailed inventory of the plant species in the woodlot was completed as part of this project. It found over 160 different plant species. This is a relatively high number for an urban woodlot, and a handful of them are rare. Approximately two-thirds of them are native, and one-third th one are non-native. While there are many native species in this woodlot, the non-native species presence is high, and their numbers are expanding rapidly, crowding out native species. Past disturbances that I mentioned, such as the deer enclosure, and current disturbances, such as wild deer, which we saw regularly in the woodlot while we were working, um, and the unofficial trail building, which includes cutting trees, digging holes, and building jumps, have provided the ideal conditions for invasive plant establishment and proliferation. The result is that the woodlot is changing into a new forest type. From the rare red oak forest type, to one that would be dominated by non-native buckthorns, maples, and shrubs, with large mats of invasive ground covers that stop the growth of native trees and plants. Most notably, this has resulted in a concerning lack of young native trees. Over the next several decades, this could result in a change of character of the woodlot from one with many large oaks to one with few large trees and shrubby thickets. Not only would this degrade the environmental value of the woodlot, it would also spoil its very special recreational and aesthetic value. To address, these above, to address these issues, I have developed 23 management recommendations and prioritized each of these. The top priority is to manage the invasive species through a removal program. I have mapped the location of many invasive species and provided a strategy to manage them, including in community engagement and through professional management. The second is to work with the Cambridge Trails Advisory Committee to adopt a less intensive trail system. This would include the possible adoption of some unofficial trails as official and the decommissioning and rehabilitation of others. Third is planting trees in the understory to replace those that have been lost from past and current use. This will ensure that there are trees in the woodlot for the future. Finally, engaging the community will be required so they can be aware and participate in the management of this important community woodlot. There are currently no community groups directly involved in its management. In summary, the woodlot is an important community piece of infrastructure that provides considerable value to the public. It has had and is currently under many pressures that have led to the dominance of invasive species. There's a lack of young native trees in the woodlot, but despite this pressure, there's still a substantial number of native species found throughout. Active management can be used to mitigate these pressures and maintain its value as a recreational area and environmentally sensitive area. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Any questions? Councillor Devine? Yes, thank you to the Chair. Uh, thank you for the presentation, fellas. Thank you very much. And it's an important part of our heritage, there's no doubt about that. Um, the trails, the unofficial trails, how many of those are wildlife trails? Um, I, I don't believe any of them are official wildlife trails. They look like they're all developed by users. Okay, so how, like the wildlife, what trails do they, they use? Do they use? Cause they, they, get, they would, they, they generally would, will not have, they will not generally walk on trails, like deer, for example, will not generally walk on trails of human scent. We, we didn't observe any wildlife trails, you know, small little trails. They all looked like trails that were, were used by users. Um, the deer that we observed would get up and, and kind of run away from us in the forest. That's what we observed. Yeah, thank you. Councillor Reed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I am concerned about the unofficial trails and I'm wondering how you, you're going to deal with them and trying to decommission them because I, I know people's habits are hard to change and uh, people's habits are that the shortest distance to where they want to go is what they're going to do and uh, so we need to have some kind of method whereby we can change that and I'm hoping that you have one. Um, yeah, I'll go back to the, the slide with all the trails. So um, you can see there the green ones are the official trails that are maintained by the city. Um, the orange ones are unofficial um, and those are ones that I've proposed for adoption to kind of combat that issue that you're talking about because people people want to walk in certain directions. So those orange ones are one, some of the ones that are wider. They appear official, even though they're not. Um, and then to discourage use of the other ones, aside from kind of diligent management and checking up, um, rehabilitation requires uh, rototilling, at least part of the visible uh, trail bed and planting with new plants and, and you can pick, pick strategically um, like raspberry plants which have thorns they aren't that pleasant to walk through um, and then very important to provide those other options um, that would be seen as, as just as good. Councillor Montero. Uh, thank you through the chair one of my questions was already answered regarding unofficial trails. Uh, the invasive species how did they get there? Uh, who, who, somebody planted them, or how did they? How they got, got to the park? Yeah. Uh, um, so one of the major invasive species is common buckthorn. It's it's been here for well over a hundred years. Um, so it's it's been naturalized. So even at the time when the park was donated, it could have been in the area. A lot of them, though, would have come from people's gardens. Um, there were there were a number of plants like. Um, Periwinkle, you might be familiar with, um, and you could see that these are common plants that people have in their gardens. Um, so I would, I would assume that that's where they've come from. The deer enclosure that was there for several decades um, would have pretty much denuded the understory and may have reduced the local seed, native seed source. And so then, because of that, seed from people's yards surrounding there could very easily have invaded the site. So that's, that's my hypothesis of, of how we ended up in this situation. But I would say that most of the invasive species that are in there are common ones that are found throughout southern Ontario and are fairly prevalent, and they take advantage of disturbance. Uh, just a follow-up question. And how much of the park has that problem? Is that a lot or just certain areas of the park? It, it's, it's spread throughout. Um, so this, this one here is the just invasive mat. So these would be kind of ground covers, uh, uh, lily of the valley and, and periwinkle. So they cover those areas there intensively, but trees and shrubs are not on this map. They're on a different map. They're pretty evenly spread out. Um, Norway maple, which is a common street tree, uh, is found throughout as well as the buckthorn. And, and there was never really a pattern. Um, they, were, they were kind of fairly evenly spread. Is the lily of the valley harmful to the existing trees? Yeah, so what, uh, what it does is it, it takes up growing space. And so when we did the survey, this was found throughout the woodlot was there weren't very many small trees. And those mats are quite dense and have very little growing out of them. Um, so essentially they just elbow their way, way in there and, and stop other trees from being successful. Thank you. Councillor Leggett. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, I notice, you know, when you look at the invasive plants, there's one missing off that, which is garlic mustard, and that's been in the, that particular forest for quite a while now. 
And I also, you know, look at what you've written in here about the uh, non-selective herbicide, uh, well, you're calling it by its chemical name. Um, are we seriously looking at doing that? And uh, you talk about uh, doing it in heavier concentrations because when I look at some of these invasive species, there's no possible way you can hand dig some of them. They're, they break, their roots break off and they, like for instance, goatweed. Goatweed is extremely difficult to eradicate out of a common garden. So I don't know how you'd ever get that out of a, a wooded area. So if we're going to be using that, when, what, what's the time frame? When are we going to start doing this sort of thing? Yeah, yeah we would only consider, sorry, through you, Mr. Chair. We would only consider use of pesticides more as a last resort. There's a number of different controls we have. Sometimes we'd physically remove them. Sometimes you can cover them up and smother it. And just and through time, you can take it back that way. But if there isn't any other controls that are an option, we would consider just a spot application of pesticides. As to the timing, we don't have the work scheduled. So we're looking for a approval of this general plan tonight. And we have, um, through the urban forest renewal projects that are in the capital budget process, we would look to schedule this along with the other work that's already ongoing. Um, I know that there are some uh, garden centers that have stopped selling the goat weed because of how invasive it is and people are still fooled about the fact that it's an attractive plant. Um, are you, in your professional area, part of the, the type of groups that would uh, try to push for places like Landscape Ontario members to not uh, sell this type of thing in their garden centers, or is that outside of what you would consider doing? Through you, Mr. Chair, that's not something that we are actively pushing ourselves, but we are members of some of the organizations that are involved in that work. Councillor Wolf. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, thank you very much for your uh, study. Uh, uh, I live very close to the park and um, ward councillor and uh, I taught at Highland School and still teach there occasionally. Uh, have you thought of using the, the school and the children as part of your, like in some of your planting or education programs? Uh, yeah, so, so some of the recommendations do involve uh, engaging the, the local school um, in two particular areas. One, it, one is edu general education uh, around invasive species and woodlot management and the importance of it. The other is um, how the students might be involved I in removing invasive species seed source from their own property, which would be a found around there. So those are two possible ways uh, of engaging the school, um, and I have considered that uh, and, and suggested that in the plan. And in terms of the trails, I know a lot of them are used by mountain biking. I know my own children, that's where they rode and made jumps and did different things like that. So I think that's part of the education is letting them know that how valuable that forest is and how maybe they should mountain bike someplace else. <laughs> Thank you. Councillor Oddshade. Oh, th thanks, Chair. My question about the plan, the work plan, has been answered about removing invasive species. So, thanks. Yeah. Council Mann. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you. Uh, thanks for the uh, presentation, gentlemen. Uh, m my only concern is what about education for the public? I want to make sure that if we're going to do this, that we make sure that the public understand what we're doing and why we're doing it. Uh, if, if this is going to be maintained, we do have to eradicate uh, certain species and, and manage uh, the woodlot appropriately but I think uh, it's so important that we make sure that the public are educated on what we're doing and why we're doing what we're doing so that uh, they become aware and supportive of that. Um, so yeah that's you're definitely right that's a very very important part um, and the, there, there is the concern that right now there's there's lots of community groups out there that could be involved. They just hope, don't happen to be involved in that time, or at this time. And, and those are some of the recommendations that I've made so that the community can take some ownership over it and understand why it's being managed in the way that it's being managed. Um, and maybe, Brian, you could speak to some of the, some of the methods that, that you might use to do that. Or if you have any, anything else. Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, we would engage the different 
parts of the community based on the activities that are happening. So you're, you're not going to see anything come out in six weeks saying, there's a brand new plan, here's all the things that are happening. It's going to come out targeted. So when there's an area of work that we're looking for volunteers for and we engage the school and some neighbors, we'll, we'll do it that way. There'll be some general kind of information sent out at other periods. So it'll be very targeted because this, this project is going to go on for several years and the messaging needs to be timely to when the work is going to happen. Councillor Devine? Yes, thank you to the chair. Um, this is one woodlot in the city. Is there any way we can, we can put on a, uh, get information out to the residents about a base of species and the effect that it has on the natural species? Because this, this is just one example here. Okay, because we, we're the woodlot to the parks uh, throughout the community and, and by the time we get into the next woodlot the situation is probably going to be worse and by the time we get into the third one the situation is going to be worse again. Is, is there any way that we can um, get this information out, out to the community about invasive species and, and please don't, uh, I mean a lot, I'm sure a lot of these things were put in that area because the, the residents genuinely thought they were doing the right thing like look, maybe Lily the Valley for example which I happen to hate because I have it in my yard and I can't get rid of the crap. Okay, if you can tell me how to get rid of it, I'd be a happy guy. Uh, but a lot, of the, a lot of the Perry one, you know, people are, are forget-me-nots. People might have just put that in there thinking that you're making it nicer and prettier, et cetera, et cetera, with the best intentions. But the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So we have to, we have to get this, this information out, out to the community on what we really shouldn't be doing. Is there, is there any plan in place to do that over, like, over the broad, broad range of the city? Through you, Thank Mr. You. Chair. We don't have a specific invasive species communication plan, but it is part of the urban forest plan. So invasive species are a very common issue across the world. As international trade gets more intense, all the invasive species come along with it. So we will be reaching out with, as we do address some of the local issues um, and engage the community as the schools and public, as, as we do through many events already. Our final question, Councillor Leggett. Through you, Mr. Chair, we're coming up on the season where people start digging in their gardens and taking away all the extra plants that they have, you know, that where, where it's overgrown. And I know for a fact that a lot of the ones that are in the woods were planted by people with good intentions who just couldn't throw those out, so they took them to the woods. I've run across that in my business many times. Um, but I'm wondering how comfortable you guys are in uh, going on a radio talk show and talking to people and saying these are the problems in our forest, that these are the types of things that cause problems and we need to stop. Through you, Mr. Chair. We have done some coverage on CBC, uh, the local Kitchener station in the past, and maybe it's time that something that on this happen issue. again. Yeah. Okay, but great. There we go. Let's get them on the radio. Thank you. I have no further questions. Councillor Wolf, you've got the motion. I'll let you table that. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Reed. Uh, the Victoria Park Woodlot Management Plan recommendation that the committee recommend to City Council that report 18076 CD Re Victoria Park Woodlot Management Plan be approved. Speaking to the motion. You may. Um, I strongly support this motion. I um, really appreciate the work uh, that was done uh, by our master's student, and uh, you know I hope uh, this is the beginning uh, of managing this woodlot, as well as uh, last in our last meeting we talked about uh, our tree bylaw and uh, looking forward to, to seeing that as well because I think all of us here at Council uh, appreciate uh, how important our tree canopy is and uh, everything we can do to increase it and maintain it, uh, we will do. Seeing no further discussion, I'm going to call the question all those in favor. Motion's carried, it's unanimous. I'm going to call up our first delegation, Mary Jane Patterson of Reef Green Solutions and Tova Davison, Sustainable Water of the Region. 
Item 6, 2050 Community GHG Emissions Reduction Target. Welcome. Chair Meta, Mayor Craig, Councillors, so great to be here. My name is Tova Davidson. I'm the Executive Director at Sustainable Waterloo Region, and I'm joined here with my friend and colleague Mary Jane Patterson from Reap Green Solutions. We are here today representing the Collaborative of Climate Action Waterloo Region, which is run in partnership between our two organizations, as well as in partnership with the region and the three cities of Cambridge, Kitchener, and Waterloo. And together we've been working on a 6% carbon reduction target by 2010, no, by 2020, based on a 2010 baseline year. And we came here about a year ago and gave you an update to how we were doing and excited to share that we've now reached milestone five through the Partners in Climate Protection. During the re-inventory that Tova talked about, where we found that we were at 5.2% of our 6% goal. So we are well on our way, as Tova said. And this past year, we started looking beyond 2020, since it's coming up pretty fast. We went out to the community. Uh, Tova will tell you some of that consultation. And we asked people what their vision is for our community 30 years down the road and what kind of greenhouse gas emissions they think we're going to need in order to achieve that vision. And that consultation has informed what we are bringing you today to ask for your support. We're asking for approval of a greenhouse gas reduction target of 80% below 2010 levels by 2050. So the first thing to note here is that we did consult the community on this. We actually went out and spoke to 1,830 people across Waterloo Region, and we didn't uh, stack the deck and only talk to the greenies. We went to hockey games and to the mall and to libraries and to community events, and we asked them what they wanted. And what we heard was that 85% of people chose a target of 50 to 100%, and 53% of people chose a target of 70% or more, so 70 to 100%. And what that tells us is that the local and national public opinion actually says that this is what the community and what people want. And there have been studies that have shown that in Waterloo Region and well beyond. This target aligns well with the scientific consensus and with provincial, federal, and international targets. The Paris Agreement sets forth a goal of keeping global temperature rise to two, per, 2 degrees centigrade or below, ideally 1.5 degrees. On the provincial side, Ontario's Climate Action Plan sets out a target of 80% by 2050, and the federal government looks set to do the same in the pan-Canadian framework. And what we are already seeing now is that federal and provincial funding eligibility requirements are looking for municipalities with targets in line with this. They are looking for municipalities with uh, ambitious greenhouse gas targets in order to provide funding for retrofitting municipal buildings, for example, under the Municipal GHG Challenge Fund or through the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. We wouldn't be alone in this target, so we would be in good company looking at other municipalities. Durham, Hamilton, London, Peel, and Toronto all have targets of 80% by 2050. And that, as Mary Jane said, is in line with what's happening provincially and federally. And so together we would all be working towards the same kind of target. And we would not be alone at the municipal level. We expect that achieving this goal will come about through a combination of local action as well as federal and provincial policies and market sh shifts. The, at the provincial level, building codes will probably require buildings to be net zero by 2030. We're seeing automobile manufacturers turn more and more from combustion engines to electric and even hydrogen. Uh, developing countries with carbon pricing will find that renewables are more attractive financially now. And even technologies that are related to this, like batteries for storage, are coming down in price. And that makes renewables more viable. 
At the local level, there's a lot that municipalities can do to further this target in land use planning policies, in transportation, in more rigorous building codes, and supporting community initiatives. And nonprofits like REAP and Sustainable Waterloo Region will be here to support. Um, and the commu community energy investment strategy by reducing energy is reducing greenhouse gas emissions. I can see that the timer is ticking down, so I will be very quick. What we're seeing is that the global clean tech industry is actually tripled, uh, and it's in, or it's tripled and intended to be at about three billion dollars by 2020. But Canada's market share in that is going down. So this is an economic opportunity for us as well. And in consulting with the business community in Cambridge, we saw that they saw clean tech as a major sector of growth. So we see this as Canada's innovation capital, and we can prosper through this sector as well as traditional technology. There's so many reasons to do this that have nothing to do with climate change. It reminds me of that cartoon that says, what if we make a better world for nothing? This is going to lead to better air quality, better human health, more livable, walkable communities, and a more attractive community for businesses and workers that want to come here. Um, one of the questions we hear is why 2010 is a baseline year, and the answer simply is that that's the data that we have. Uh, we do not have data to go further back. However, provincial greenhouse gas tar um, numbers show that 1990 and 2010 are not noticeably different, and so having a 2010 baseline year does not put Waterloo Region at a disadvantage. So, first we set a target, then we implement the plans to, re to reach it. We're proposing a backcasting method, beginning with that vision of the future that our community saw, and then making plans to meet that in 10-year chunks. As well as those 10-year chunks, we would do re-inventories every five years to make sure that we were on target. So we are here to talk about community council approval. We would love to um, have the approval of Cambridge. We will be going to the region, have already spoken to Kitchener and Waterloo. And then, as Mary Jane said, we will work on designing that first 10-year plan. And I'll, I'll just add that uh, we have been to all the townships and presented this information there, and they know that their mayors will be at the regional council when it comes before the region. Uh, we want to say a big thank you to staff, especially Paul Wilms, for working with us and helping make this historic moment possible. Uh, and to Kate Daly, plan manager, and Hannah Dubber, a co-op student who really were instrumental. And now we ask for your support, City of Cambridge, for this historic target of an 80% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions, Councillor Adshade? Uh, thank you, Chair, um, and uh, Tova and Mary Jane. Thanks for your presentation. And I think that's a wonderful goal, like for 80% uh, greenhouse gas reduction by 2050. That's wonderful. And I know there's different different communities are setting that similar type of goals. Do you really think that's? Do you think, I know you're talking about, yeah. you know, like the cars by 2025 will have a lot better um, emission standards. But it seems to me that's an awful hard goal to achieve. Is it realistic to have 80 percent? And by 2050? We actually did some modeling for how would this be possible. And one of the things we saw, and this is a great example of what could happen and what we see happening, is that 49% of the carbon emissions in Waterloo Region are from transportation right now. If you look at the rate of adoption and of acceleration in electric vehicle technology, the electricity grid here is very clean and is only moving to a cleaner grid. If we just change transportation, and think about how many times we all will change our cars in the next 30 years, the thought that we won't be driving electric, electric or hydrogen vehicles uh, seems actually kind of silly yeah. when you think 30 years. So is this possible? Absolutely. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Reid. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a couple of questions. Um, I'm, I know that I, I really was interested, and thank you for this uh, report. I found it uh, quite fascinating. And, but one of the things that I, I would like you to explain, because I think we need to put some emphasis on this for the public, is how supporting the setting this emissions is for our, uh, an impetus for our economic development. That's my first question. Okay. Um, it's essential for our economic development, and in some ways, we are already leaders with many very cool clean tech 
businesses located in Cambridge. And um, I think you'll be hearing from one of them tonight. Um, and in other ways, I've heard you say, Tovo, Canada itself is falling behind a little bit in this industry, so we want to be at the forefront of this. And really, our community is especially positioned to be uh, a real leader in clean tech with the startup culture that we have and with the many businesses we already have here. The other thing I would add to that um, is that what we're seeing in our other programs at Sustainable Waterloo Region when we work with businesses is that the bright young minds that want to work in this region will only do it in places that are values aligned with them. So they care what their community is doing and what their company is doing. So if we want to retain those bright students, we need to be showing that this is the place that aligns with what they believe in too. Thank you, I, I love those answers. Now this one's a little more difficult and a, a little more suppositional uh, in that uh, we are going into a provincial election. Mm -hmm. Supposing there was a change of government mm -hmm. and that change of government resulted in <coughs> the government not supporting emissions and not supporting an 80% and not supporting a carbon tax. What do we do then? How, do, how is this going to affect what we are doing here? I think that that is actually an opportunity for leadership on municipal government's parts. If you look at what actually happened in the United States when Trump came in and he started to pull away the EPA, all of the cities, the major cities across the U.S. stepped up and said, you can do that if you want, we're going to go further than you were at. So it actually presents an opportunity for you as, as leaders to say, this is the right way to go and we're going to take us there. I love that answer. Thank you. <laughs> Council Leggett. Through you, Mr. Chair, I have a couple of questions, but could you first answer for me, when did the federal and provincial government adopt the United Nations Environmental Program for the 80% target? When did that happen? Well, the Paris Agreement was, I believe, two years ago, and then the 80% target is part of the Climate Action Plan from the province of Ontario that came out two years ago also. Okay, I, I just I'm reading the uh, that the 80% target was part of the United Nations Environment Program. So I'm just trying to figure out when our government bought into that one. It's in response to that program. The, yeah, the United Nations um, was what happened in Paris, COP21 in Paris, and so that's we signed on as Canada to that agreement. So pretty immediate. Okay, so my questions. Um, when you were speaking about the clean tech sector shrinking in Canada and, and locally we have something similar, I don't look at just the clean tech for that. I also look at what the existing sectors are in our community. So um, are there some um, things that you think that they could do and some examples of those uh, sectors? Um, I'm really excited that one of the other delegations is here to speak to that, so I will leave some of it. I would normally tell his story, but I will let him tell it. Okay. Um, but however, I, we have seen uh, growth in these areas. Uh, BWXT, for example, does a lot of work in wind turbines and nuclear. Those are clean energy, um, they're carbon reduced energy sources. So those are the things when you think of manufacturing, you don't always think of it as being something that ties to clean tech, but indeed it does. Okay, my final question then. The, the land use planning that you were talking about to yield economic uh, benefits through, through this, um, could you give some examples of what you see that being? I think a really good example is building transit and having intensification of development along the transit routes. So that really helps us be able to live without a car and um, prevent sprawl, which is entirely dependent on cars. Anything else though besides that one? That's a given, I think. Mm. Yeah, there are um, some policies that municipalities can put in place, things like requiring um, high density housing, condo buildings, to have conduits to allow for electric vehicle charging in the future. It could include um, eliminating or, or um, reducing the minimum parking. Uh, you could be looking, uh, 
at, and actually there is an organization in Kitchener that did that, and they provide um, subsidies for transit instead. Um, you could be looking at a number of things like um, walkable cities, investment in trails, that sort of thing, which gets people using active transportation. Transportation at 49% is the major area we need to focus on. You then look at some of the other sort of infrastructure changes to businesses and buildings, as well as residential changes. Okay, thanks. I just wanted to acknowledge that our regional councillor Carl Kiefer is in the room. Yeah. I'm going to move on to our next uh, question, Councillor Mann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I thought you missed me. Tova and Mary Jane, thank you for the presentation this evening. You know, most of us in this room uh, are probably baby boomers. And so we grew up in an era that uh, had the use of unlimited fossil fuel and unaware of the impact that that has on our environment. Um, until, of course, our young people today, the young bright minds that you talk about, bring it to our attention and remind us of what we're doing to our environment. What are we doing to future generations, to future leaders of our community? And it's only through them that we start to take a second look at what it is that we are doing and how can we prevent uh, greenhouse uh, emissions. And so my question, first of all, my first question is, uh, what is it that each of us individually could do to help reduce that greenhouse emission on an individual level? Because we can look around and say that, well, let's reduce our fleet or let's change our fleet from, from a gasoline engine to something else. But what is it that we could do individually? There's a lot that we can do individually, and it starts at home. Um, transportation is certainly a big one, and within our own ability to um, use active transportation and transit. I think, for example, um, new changes in the GRT and um, the ION coming to other parts of the region and eventually here, those are really big opportunities for us to use them and make them part of our daily lives. And at home, um, we're. REAP is looking to bring a tool to the region that will help us each calculate our own greenhouse gas emissions and what part of our lives they result from. Um, looking at our own uh, building, the buildings that we live in, those are a pretty big opportunity there. And the older the building, the more opportunity there is. Something very simple, not a new technology, insulation in the walls, the basement, and the attic. 80% of the energy we use at home is to heat the home and the water in the home. So that's a really big opportunity right there. Great, thank you. And uh, my other question is, I, I know we look at 5.2% uh, uh, reduction between 90 and 2010, and, and we would say that's a very small amount in 20 years, and we're looking for such a significant amount over the next 30 years. But would it be fair to say that that 5.2 is because we were developing plans and strategies to get us to a point where we could look at an 80% reduction? So 5.2 was from 2010 to 2015. That was in five years, just to clarify. But um, yes, it is partly a shifting of how we think and consider this as well. So there is culture um, change that happens. There is changing people's hearts and minds, making this an awareness piece. Um, if any of you have young children in your families, you'll know that they're talking about this an awful lot. Uh, don't you dare try to put something that's compostable into the garbage because they will stop you. Um, and and so there is a shift that is happening. So yes, I think that is coming. Thanks very much. And, and interesting that you say that. Uh, that happens when my, when my kids come home. And um, they remind me that uh, they don't drive vehicles because they don't need to today, yeah. whereas I needed to and I wanted it before I was 16. I have a 17-year-old son who doesn't know if he'll ever own a car and has no interest in getting his license. Interesting. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. Councillor Devine. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> thank you very much for your presentation. Um, the reduction targets are aggressive. There's no doubt about that. Fortunately for us, technology is changing at a very rapid pace. If you take a look um, at Ward 2, the power center, uh, the, well, obviously it's not the future because it's there now. There is 15 Tesla chargers there mm -hmm. that were put in the last two or three months. Quite interesting. And it's really helped the businesses out a lot because the people will they'll stop half an hour, charge the vehicle. They go shopping, go wherever, go for a bite to eat, go for a coffee. 
Um, so it's really helped out. But my, my question is, the 401 in, for us in this region can either be our friend or it can kill us. Obviously, those Tesla charges there because of the 401, the volume goes up and down. Do we have any idea how much uh, emission comes off the 401 in this region? Do we have any idea at all? Because like, that, be, that has to be huge. It has to be huge. Yeah, that wouldn't be calculated in our local because it would be considered a provincial highway. Um, so I haven't heard a number. No. No, okay. that's a good question. Yeah, I think yeah, thank a you. very good question. And that is an interesting question. I remember growing up, I'd see a black cloud of smoke over the highway, like yep. in Saginaw. It is serious. Councilor Wolf. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, thank you for your presentation and for all the work you've done for years on this, this topic. Uh, thank you also for showing and telling us all the different ways uh, we as a city and individuals can reduce our emissions. And I'm confident that with the new technology and our awareness that we can reach this target. My question is, should we try for 85%? Cambridge has been a leader environmentally. We have our gold lead city hall. All our buildings have to be gold. So why should we be like everyone else? 80? Why not 85? What do you think? Well, I like to think of it as a minimum. <clears throat> I think for uh, having a common message across the region, we'd love it to be 80, but boy, I sure don't like to stop that enthusiasm, so I'm <laughs> torn. Council, I get Through you, uh, Mr. Chair, again, um, when I look at the survey that was done in the region and the comment about uh, some of the people had uh, trepidation about the costs of, of mm -hmm. the, the reduction. Um, have you seen, I, I know it's pretty close to that still, but have you seen people starting to come on board that you're talking to and not being so fearful about it? And are you considering doing another survey like at, at, like yeah. at a two year point or something? Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that Climate Action uh, has learned as an organ, as a program from this uh, outreach to the community is that we need to do this every year. So we will be going out every year to speak to citizens, um, to do education, to get their feedback, to get input, to test that idea of what are they thinking, how are they seeing this, um, to be able to not only move the target forward, but also continue to be plugged into them. I have no further questions. Thank you very much. We're going to move into our next delegation, Jessica Fisher. Welcome. Wonderful. Good evening, Mayor Craig and City Councilors. My name is Jessica Fisher, and I've been a resident of Cambridge for about seven years. I'm here tonight representing myself and my neighbors, the residents of Cambridge, to urge you to adopt an 80% greenhouse gas emission reduction target by 2050, speaking in support of what we just heard from Tova and Mary Jane. I recently became a mother to 15-month-old Poppy, who was here earlier with her father, um, but we kept her up past her bedtime so she couldn't stick around for my remarks. I wasn't sure I ever wanted to have children, I used to say, how could anyone be so irresponsible as to bring a child into this world with all its problems? But of course, I feel differently now. I believe more than ever that it is our opportunity and our responsibility to ensure that next generations have access to clean air, reliable energy, the natural environment, and high-quality jobs. Adopting a local GHG target is one step towards this vision. So what do we know about the power of target setting? We know that having a clear target to strive for keeps us focused and provides motivation to enact the supports that will help us make progress toward the target. We know that an ambitious but realistic target, like the one being proposed, positions Cambridge alongside our closest peers, as we heard, London, Peel, Hamilton, and Toronto, who have all set an 80% reduction target. <clears throat> we don't have to reinvent the wheel or do this alone. We can connect with our peers 
and to share learnings and develop partnerships that harness the synergies of other municipalities and provinces also doing their part to tackle climate change. <clears throat> we know adopting a meaningful target brings opportunities for innovation. Over time, with the advancement of technologies, the strengthening of our local economy, and the momentum that will be built through progress made, Cambridge's businesses, residents, and governments will innovate, finding new and creative ways to keep local emissions on a downward trajectory. We know there are economic benefits to be achieved through the adoption of an 80% target and the reductions that would follow. A meaningful target positions Cambridge as a world-class city, strengthening our reputation as a great place to do business, visit, and live. It provides incentive for investments in energy-saving technologies, retrofits and greener transportation options, and many of those investments would be enjoyed by local contractors, technology firms, and utilities. In other words, those would be dollars invested in and staying within our local community. We know that without a meaningful target, we will not achieve deep greenhouse gas reductions, and this will mean missed opportunities for our city. I don't think we would want to miss the opportunity to use the adoption of an ambitious target as a platform to educate and empower residents, bringing them along toward the green economy that is undoubtedly the way of the future. We know that the average citizen needs help to understand greenhouse gas accounting and management, and that the city has a key role to play in building this sustainability literacy. More importantly, once that literacy is established, residents can be expected to more widely access the programs and supports available to help them do their part, whether that's retrofitting their home, choosing public transit, or making greener purchasing decisions. Please recall that the proposed 80% target was informed by a thorough public consultation process and time and again, residents voiced their support for an ambitious target. To summarize, there is evidence showing that an ambitious greenhouse gas emission reduction target leads to meaningful reductions in carbon emissions and a host of far-reaching benefits to our community. Improved air quality and health outcomes, a more resilient local energy system, economic benefits through business attraction and investment, a more engaged, empowered, and connected community, and an improved overall quality of life for Cambridge residents. May I finish? But I feel that the benefit I feel most excited about is the message of empowerment that this target would send to every resident of our community and beyond. It says Cambridge is forward thinking, a city doing its part to contribute to the green economy, and that the city will enact policies and programs to bring residents along on this journey. Let's ensure our community remains one of the very best places to live, work, and play. By taking decisive action now, we're laying the groundwork for a vibrant, healthy community to be enjoyed by ourselves, by Poppy and her peers, and for generations to come. On behalf of the residents of Cambridge, I urge you to adopt this 80% reduction target by 2050, then let's get to work implementing it and reaping the rewards. Thank you. Any questions, members of the committee? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Paul Rack from Veriform Incorporated, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Mayor, and Council. Uh, my name is Paul Rack, and uh, I own a company, three companies here in Cambridge. I've been in business for 21 years. I grew up in Cambridge after we escaped from Europe uh, from uh, 1969 after the um, Russian invasion. Um, so we've uh, lived in Cambridge, and uh, Veriform is just up on Bishop and Franklin. So let me get my presentation here. See my presentation? Would anybody? Uh, I can do it. Sure. sure. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah. Perfect. Can you stop me? Is this up and down, right? Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Great. Thank you. So, what, when the other speakers were talking, I heard the council members asking really good questions about can we really achieve 80 percent? And I and I, I totally sympathize. Uh, I done 77% of my business, and I'll show you how we did it. Uh, I can only show so much in a five-minute um, uh, presentation, but I'll do it my best I can. Um, so here we are, we're, we're at Bishop and Franklin. So you can see, this is about two-year-old photograph. You can see the roundabout being uh, made there. It's 
Cambridge Hydro to the left and Veriforms down on the bottom left. That's uh, last year. Uh, there's a photograph of our offices. And uh, we started our business in 1997, first on Industrial Road in the old Savage Shoe building. And then we moved to this facility here about 13 years ago. And we purchased it outright. The building itself was built in 1982, so it's not very high technology facility. And we still achieved 77.1% reduction in that old facility. We expanded uh, in 2006. Uh, the city gave us a permit to expand, and uh, they allowed us to really maximize the property. Today, we wouldn't, probably wouldn't be allowed to maximize the 26,000 square feet, so we were very lucky to, to get that much square footage. In the last 11 years, we've done over 100 sustainability projects. By sustainability projects, I'm referring to something as simple as changing lights in, the, in our factory or in our plant, upgrading our HVAC systems. We've also done some innovative things, but everything we've done is really low tech. Now, the 11 years, it started 11 years ago when my daughter was born. And the same story uh, as my, my, my last speaker, when you have a child, it really just change your, change your, your, your view on things. And I thought, you know, I have a business here now in, in, in uh, Cambridge for nine years. Let's make it more than just making money. Let's, let's actually do some stuff while we're here and make it better for our staff. Actually, our turnover rate has gone amazingly well. We have almost no staff in the last seven or eight years uh, going elsewhere. I just want to share one innovative uh, low-tech solution. You see the bay doors. This is on the, the Cowan's View side. Those bay doors in the wintertime are open as much as four hours a day. National Steel Car out of Hamilton was bringing truckloads, four truckloads a day, two truckloads of steel coming in, two truckloads of parts going out. Our customers are Steelcraft, uh, Hitachi in Guelph, uh, BWXT Babcock's here, uh, National Steel Car in Hamilton. So we have big machines, presses, forklifts. Our biggest press is 900 tons. Imagine a 20-foot, 900-ton press. So one of the largest presses in the region. So those doors are open four hours a day. We put little sensors on the doors. When the doors open, the driver now has a 10-minute grace. Get that truck in here, close the doors, you're, you're good. If he leaves the doors open more than 10 minutes, the heat is set back, which means now there's no more heating until it drops to a certain level. You wouldn't believe how fast our staff get those doors closed after 10 minutes. We have a little, little uh, uh, blinking light that warns them that they pass the 10 minutes. That's a $2,500 solution. Saves us 28000 a year in natural gas costs. Natural gas is a huge CO2 emitter. So again, everything's low tech. If you drive by our facility, we're just, a, just come on by. Um, I'm at five minutes already. <laughs> you have about okay. another minute or so. Okay, good. Um, it's very low tech. We have no solar, no geothermal, nothing at all in our facility that would make you aware that we've done a 77.0% reduction in uh, GHG gas. Here is our chart for the last 11 years. 2006, my daughter was born, and then it goes down. And it's the first four or five years where we did our biggest initiatives. It's incredible. I mean, some of the things, I, if, I, if you come to our plant, drop in, I'll, I'll show you them. You would say, that is so simple. Timers, timers on our big steam. We have a 200 watt steam uh, generator for our steam cleaning. We put a timer on there, half an hour. Before it was running all day. The staff would turn it on in the morning, we'll have it running all day until the end of the day. You see by the end, last year we were down to 60. That's 77.1%. We haven't even done our biggest uh, uh, initiative yet, which is to change all our lights from T5 to LED, which will get us to 85% reduction in 11 years. We've saved over $2 million in the last 11 years. Over half of that is energy costs, uh, electricity, and natural gas. So a half is energy costs. Another 40% is maintenance costs. When you have more efficient machines, they break down less. That's, that's the real big one. And in fact, uh, Bob Willard, one of the biggest uh, advocates in Canada of GHG emission reduction, he, he, uh, he and I had a discussion about that. Maintenance is the, one of the biggest things in a city or industrial environment that would really benefit from GHG reduction. We've reduced our emissions by 202 tons. And in fact, you should be proud of this. In, in, uh, in Cambridge, we're the fourth company in Canada to achieve this, this standard, ISO 50001. You've all heard of ISO 9001, right? That's the, the quality standard by which you can supply automotive and other big tech sectors. Well, we were the fourth company in Canada to achieve that, and that by that means we, were actually, uh, we have a goal every year to reduce our energy usage by 10% every year. This is our, our green team. It's myself, Jerry, and Jason. 
And again, I mentioned our 10% uh, uh, annual reduction goal. This is our, our whole team. As a result of all initiatives, we have survived some really bad recessions. We've hired 25% more staff than we did 11 years ago. And as I mentioned, we increased our footage. Bear that in mind. We increased our footage and still did 77.1% reduction. Cambridge can double its population and still get that 80% target. And that's what I would be worried about as a counselor. How can I do this and still grow? We've done it. We've, we're now supplying more parts. We've had our best three years in the history of our company. And we have more staff, more building space, and we still cut our carbon footprint. And our carbon footprint is actually uh, independently audited. It's not done in, uh, internally. So I would like to close. If you do come by our facility, knock on the door, and I'll give you a tour. Thank you. That's all very interesting. I'd love to see it sometime. Councillor Devine, do you have a question? I do. First of all, I will take you up in your offer. Yes. Okay. Yes, I'd be pleased to take you up in your offer. Um, I see your hydro reduction has been more than substantial, to say the least. You've done a great job. You've done a wonderful job. But on, I have a question on your graph there, uh, where it has the one thing that has not changed a whole lot, I mean, you've done a fantastic job, gas, stationary, um, the Penguin Fleet Mobile, perfect. The one that really hasn't changed is your employee commute. Is that like people, your, your employees driving back and forth to work? Exactly. Okay. But if you it's factor in the fact that we have more staff, sorry, if we have more staff today, yeah. that is still a considerable reduction in terms of uh, uh, we have staff now coming from uh, uh, Brantford, uh, New Hamburg. We have actually, today we have staff driving in further from okay. than they did before. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this, this is well, what you've done is remarkable. And I've worked, I used to work in that industry for years, and you've, you've done a great, fantastic job, particularly in the hydro. That's unbelievable. And all low tech. Thank you. Great stuff. John Grothier, when he was president of Cambridge Chamber, took our list of our 37 initiatives, our first 37, and he, he actually gave it to his staff and said, you guys you need to do this at our building. So that was John. Councillor Reid. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I was, I'm just astounded by what you were able to accomplish, but I have a question to ask you. Is uh, I sit on the Economic Development Advisory Committee, and although I don't have the right to ask you to come before them, but if we did decide that we, you would, uh, we would like you to make a presentation to that advisory committee, would you be available and would you want to do that? I would very much. I actually uh, present to McMaster every year, university. I do a, a three-hour class there. I present to Conestoga College and to University of Waterloo, so I'd be happy to. Okay, so I shall look into that. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you, my question is similar to Councillor Reed. I, I thought, um, how could you come forward and help us and how, how we could attain uh, something like you have achieved over that time period? But now I just want to ask you if you're in the right business and should you be in consulting instead? <laughs> Congratulations. Thank Very you. well done. Thank you. Very well done. Thanks for showing us this. Thank you. Councillor Adshade. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Chair. And Paul, thanks for the presentation. and. Just a remarkable what you've done, um, you know, expanding, like more than doubling your size and managed to, to get the greenhouse, uh, the gas reductions and all the, with the savings. And my question is similar to Councillor Reed and Councillor Mann, but have you, have you done this presentation to local businesses or have you, thought, have you done some or, or could you? Because I, I think that's just amazing. Thank you. Uh, you did to the chamber, I know, but is there, have you actually gone out to businesses? And, Yes, uh, okay. we've done it to businesses. The, the chamber did, uh, ha Greg did have us doing presentations about uh, 11, 10 years ago. We were doing them for about three or four years, three or four times a year. The message started getting out, so we were, the demand was less for the message. But now I speak mostly to university uh, and college level, and I actually sit on a board at Conestoga where we actually review sustainability courses. So now we're, I'm, I'm rubbing shoulders with folks. We're approving sustainability courses for future generations, young folks coming in to help us achieve these goals. And there's, they're actually looking for jobs. So I was hoping that the city would actually entertain expanding it because you'll save money. Like there's no doubt about it. You'll save money. It doesn't cost money. Like I, I'm, we're living proof of it. Yeah, it's a win-win. It's a huge win-win. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. 
Councillor Leggett. Through you, Mr. Chair, I have that same problem with the overhead doors, only my solution is my staff hate being cold, so it's like down just like that. I don't have to have the special lights. Um, when I looked at the uh, overhead of your building, there was a huge, massive flat roofs. Have you done anything to uh, have heat retention in there? What have you done? That's really when interesting. We, when we purchased, when we expanded in 2006, um, we had Sheetal Construction in, in Hesco do the work. We asked them what insulation they were going to put in the ceiling. And I believe at the time it was R5 or R10. And our homes now are R50 or R60 as a minimum. I asked them if they could do uh, R20. And I believe they charged me $6,000. When we did the an analysis, the payback was about six years. Now, typical business owners don't like a six-year payback. But I said, well, this is my building. It's an investment in, in future. I'll pay the six thousand dollars, even, even if it takes me six years to recoup that. Yeah. So that's on the inside. Uh, it's on between the the white liner, which is another thing we actually put in a white liner to reflect the sunlight. Okay. Uh, so there's less heat built up in the summertime. Uh, but but the R20 was the most important thing uh, for uh, retention in the wintertime. Great. Thanks. I have no further questions on behalf of the thank committee. You. I do want to thank you for coming in. Thank you. We're all very impressed by your leadership and what you've been able to achieve. And I'm sure there's going to be other great things in the future. And just keep doing what you're doing. And we're all thrilled that you've chosen Cambridge. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're very welcome. Uh, Councillor Leggett, you've got the item, item six. I'll let you table that. Is that the last delegation? Uh, no, I think they went together, didn't they? They went yeah, together. All oh, delegations finished? Yes. yes. For, for that I, item. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. One, one and four went together. Okay. Moved by myself, seconded by Mayor Craig. The uh, motion as printed, and I just would like a question to staff. Uh, so when I when I was reading through this, um, there was the uh, comment on page 32 that says that we may also wish to incorporate a long-term emissions reduction target in the future management plan for 2020 to 2030. Are we actually seriously looking at incorporating it, or do we know that yet? Paul? Huh? For you, Mr. Chair. Um, Councillor, we haven't started the corporate yet. This is the community, so that was just a, we always seem to try to differentiate between what we do corporately. We're a kind of a small and medium-sized business and the bigger footprint of the region. Um, so it is something that we can talk about. Is it an 80 percent? You know, is it 100? Is it 85? Is it 70? What makes sense? So. The first generation of plans, whether it was the community or the corporate, we started with all the actions, rolled them up. Uh, Mr. Rack just talked about, is it 100? 100 projects that you did? Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Corporately, we've done 200. We have a similar number of projects at the community level, so we would just have to, um, you know, look at that and what makes sense for us. I think we'd want to do the same. We'd want to do some consultation. What, have, what does the public feel comfortable with? What is staff responsible for all these emissions reductions feel comfortable with? So, so that yeah. would come after we've done uh, this part here, then we would look at doing that. So are we looking at that in sometime in the early 20s? Yeah, so generally we've moved together with the community plan. All the municipalities have. We do our corporate in-house, so that's our fleet and our buildings and community side the fleet and buildings are our cars and houses and businesses. So, you know, timing wise, I think that'll probably get started later this fall, if oh, not in the new okay. year. Um, so we have a similar process to go through. We want to report back to council on, did we actually make the 6% target? Bring the new target, so that's the long term, and then bring a, a 2020 to 2030 plan. Okay. So, yeah. Thanks, Paul. Okay. Councillor Wolf. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. And while you're still here, Paul, is 85% doable for us? Par pardon me? Is 85% doable for us as a target? Well, 
Well, after seeing Paul Rack's presentation, I think anything is doable. Um, you know, it's nice to see those type of examples. There, there are many others, um, not necessarily Cambridge businesses or developers. Um, you know, it's such a, I guess I feel more comfortable with what's 2030 and is 20% doable on top of all the projects we've done. 80% um, is sort of that long distance, give us that general direction. Um, what you heard today, you know, I, th I think a lot of it is we have to remove fear. Part of removing fear personally for me is do I think we can get there? And so I have to get my head around, you know, somebody mentioned, I think it was MJ and Tova, the, the energy plan. So that was 50% reduction right there. Mm -hmm. Somebody mentioned the, um, the crystal ball. So what's going to come 10 years from now in terms of innovations? Are we all going to have a battery on our wall? So I think, yes, I, I always like keeping it simple, though. I love that the community plan was 6% and our corporate plan was 6%. Easy to remember. All these percentages. I, you know, 80 would be nice. Keep it consistent. Okay. All right. Thank you. Councilor Mann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, just speaking to the motion, um, I, I know what Councilor Wolf is asking, and maybe, maybe all it needs to say is 80% or better. Uh, and, and we could strive for 100. But uh, when, I, when I think of our community and our region, um, Waterloo Region has been a leader in many aspects uh, over the years. Uh, we can all think of uh, issues that we've had, whether it be the pandemic issue or major crises that have taken place in our community. Waterloo Region has always stepped up to the plate and has always been a leader. And here's an opportunity for us to again be leaders as far as caring about our environment, caring about the next generation who are going to come forward, listening to what that generation is saying and putting into practice some of the things that they want and need and being responsible for fulfilling those needs. We have, we have the opportunity right now to demonstrate our responsibility of uh, passing this motion. And uh, it's all about doing the right thing. And this is the right time to do the right thing. And I think this is, this is a great motion that has to go forward and uh, I support it fully. Yeah, I see no further comments. I'm gonna call the question as a recorded vote. Well, uh, well I'll let you speak, Councilor Wolfbaum. You have another question? Uh, not a question, but, but I'd like to add those words or better then to the motion. Is that a friendly amendment? 80% or better? Um, if, if I'm, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, through you to Councilor Wolf, I, I think it may be best to leave it at the 80% and allow us as the staff level to work together to figure to establish how we would get to the 80% and make sure they're attainable goals and, and actual measurable goals because the or better part becomes difficult to measure. Um, but I think our, our I goal, think that's 81. <laughs> <laughs> or 80.5. Um, and uh, so I think that would be the best way we can report out on that with the 80 percent, but striving to go higher if, if possible. Okay. I just, you know, if you aim at nothing, you're sure to hit it. So I, I, uh, I like the idea of having a high uh, goal, but I'll go along with the 80. Mayor Craig. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm not. In the, I'm going to support the motion, obviously, but. Just want to say that <clears throat> what impressed me tonight with the speakers and the variety of the speakers in terms of the mum that changed her mind about children and about Paul Rack coming here as just an average business person and demonstrating what he could do. And of course, Paul Wilms, who's the environmental steward for the city hall in many respects and has been a leader for years in environmental issues. And I think that's what is impressive tonight. Thank you. So yeah, we'll do the vote now as a poll vote.
Thank you all for coming in. Well done, everyone. We do have another delegation, Tova Davidson from Sustainable Water of the Region. Uh, the Sustainable Water of the Region update. I'd like to welcome you again. I'll call a two minute recess. Did you want me to do that, Councilor Devon? Back. Yeah, you can. If you could make your way back to your seats, we'll get into our presentation. Hi, Tova. Welcome. Looking forward to hearing what you've got to say with the update. Thank you so much. Um, Mayor, councillors, it's my pleasure to be here. Um, what a high note to come in on, so thank you for that vote just now. I am here to do our annual update on what's been happening at Sustainable Waterloo Region. You should all have a copy of our year-end report in front of you. Um, lots and lots of information in there. So let's just run through. Um, 2018 is 10 year history uh, now, uh, anniversary of Sustainable Waterloo Region. Uh, this year's uh, year in report has 100 stories of organizations across the region. And if you go to the very back page, there's actually an index. So you can see all of the stories that we've highlighted this year in the report. We have over 1,000 people come to our events uh, in one program alone. Uh, the impact of that program, the Regional Sustainability Initiative, which I'll talk about in a second, is the equivalent of 10,000 cars off the road. Uh, Waterloo Region loves data and we manage over 100,000 data points that come uh, in sustainability. And in partnership with uh, other organizations, including Reef Green Solutions, we measure and manage uh, over a million tons of greenhouse gas emissions in this region, but it's one movement. So I'm just going to give you a quick update on all of the things that we've been doing. I'm not going to talk about climate action. We've just had a, a really big moment for climate action. Um, 
and moving forward on that 80% target. Sustainable Waterloo Region also manages Charge WR. It's actually right now a 100% volunteer run program that supports the adoption of uh, electric vehicle technology, whether it's charging stations or the vehicles themselves. We saw an increase of vehicles over and charging stations actually over 200% in Waterloo Region last year alone. So there's almost 560 electric vehicles registered here and about 85 charging publicly available charging ports. There are many more, but some of them are at businesses, for example, or individuals' homes. Um, and we have a goal of having 1,000 electric vehicles in Waterloo Region by 2020, and if we follow the trajectory that you see on this graph, we should hit it next year. So that's really, really exciting. Oh, and one note on that, we actually held a National Drive Electric Week event September 16th at Kitchener City Hall for the whole region, and it was the largest one in Canada. So there is definitely interest. There were over 400 people came to that event. Uh, the thing that uh, people are talking about the most is the Evolve building. I don't know if you saw in the news, but about two weeks ago, it was designated as Canada's very first carbon neutral designed building. It is being built at the David Johnson Research and Tech Park. It's 110,000 square feet. Uh, again, not using brand new technologies to the story that Paul Rock shared. Um, and it is net positive energy, generates more energy than it needs, and was done within the developer's approved budget. So it's scalable. We actually did a feasibility study through the Federation of Canadian Municipalities and it is online and available to anybody who wants to see exactly how this kind of a building is developed. We're also working on the Evolve Green and that is a space uh, on the ground floor of the Evolve One building where we are working with the universities, the Accelerator Centre, some small businesses and other not-for-profits including REAP in the creation of a clean tech cluster development hub and David Rowade who knows all the details actually corrected me that the clean tech industry in uh, around the world is three trillion dollars not billion. Uh, so we will be changing that for the regional uh, pr representation, but also that we are looking in this space to build that cluster here across Waterloo Region. This is the architect's rendering of what the building looks like. As if you were looking at it from the LRT stop and over the left corner, those are solar panels covering the parking lot. And that's what it looked like about a month ago. People will be moving in this fall. The Regional Sustainability Initiative is the program that everyone knows us for, and if you go to the center spread of the year and report, you'll actually be able to see the targets that organizations have set. We are very proud that uh, Vera Foreman, Paul Rack, uh, was one of the first members of that program and that we've worked with him on those reductions. Uh, that uh, program has 57,000 tons committed to being reduced and over 41,000 tons reduced already. We've had a, quite a number of new members over the course of 2017 and 2018, and the major change in that year was that we had more targets set than any year in our history. We also run the TravelWise program, and, and oh, before I forget, I'm sorry, I'm going to go over. If anyone wants to hear more details from Paul Rack, we are hosting him at an event on May 22nd, and as members of the Regional Sustainability Initiative, which the City of Cambridge is, you have free passes to come to that event. So it's an hour and a half, 22nd, 9 a.m. Uh, where? Mm, that's a good question. It's on our website. I can get that to you. Um, so if you are interested. TravelWise is a program that's run in partnership with the region of Waterloo. We deliver it on their behalf. And if you don't know, it's actually subsidized in Cambridge for two years for free, offering uh, discounted transit passes, carpool matching software, and an emergency ride home service to employees to get down that employee commute number. They had a bunch of new members as well, including Grosch, who is a key uh, player here, and the Idea Exchange. So we are 10 years, but one movement. Really happy to share what we've been working on. Thank you for the support of the City of Cambridge on so many of these programs, for the participation as members, um, and for your commitment to ongoing um, sustainability within our community. Thank you. Any questions? Seeing none on behalf of the committee, just want to applaud you for all the work that you've done. Thank and, you. Uh, thanks for coming in tonight. Thanks.
So, uh, Councillor Reed, you've got item seven. I'll let you table the motion. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the motion is on the <clears throat> bike share pilot, and uh, the recommendation is that we approve the uh, bike share pilot. The reason that I uh, pulled this item was because uh, I had experienced within my uh, ward a number of people who uh, didn't really understand uh, why we we were putting in bike trails and uh, they they didn't see the need for the bike trails they didn't think that that uh, enough people were using them and I just really felt that uh, we needed to get that information out to the public what we are doing and the bike share program that <coughs> if we approve that is another step along the way towards this act of transportation that we're talking about. I really like what Jessica had to say tonight about sustainable literacy. And I think that that's what I'm wanting to say here is that we need to in some way, shape or form, uh, get the public more aware of our bike trails and, and the availability that will come with this bike share program. I don't have a suggestion as to how that could be done but I would just leave it with staff to say, well, if there's some way we can make it a little more public, I would certainly support that. So it's moved by myself and it is seconded by Councillor Adshay. I see no speakers. I'm gonna call the question, all those in favor? The motion is carried unanimously. Councillor Devine, you've got the consent. I'll let you table that. Very kind of you, thank you. Uh, moved by myself, count seconded by uh, Councillor Leggett, items one to 10. Number seven was taken up. Consent all agenda. All those in favor? Carried. Under other business, Mayor Craig, you have an update on the bridges? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I'll just give you an update. We had a meeting at the region today. Uh, it was in closed session <clears throat> with a few items that were released publicly, and I think we should bring everyone up to date. You know, I have concerns as we get into this warmer weather of what we may uh, be in, uh, having uh, be facing in terms of uh, the, some of the issues that we're seeing. And, uh, what happened today, and I thought it was very good, and it's all good news with the bridges in terms of the fact that the region has capped the number of uh, people that can use the bridges at 78, which, which was their original capacity. Uh, any overflow is now uh, directed or mandated to go to motels. And I had concerns about that because some of the motels, some of the issues that uh, they had run into were uh, drug dealing and violence and things like that and there are apparently outreach workers that are going to be watching these kinds of things as people are put into hotels and so on. They're getting more staff, uh, they're getting more uh, uh, administrative support and uh, they are going through an ongoing uh, reorganization which is still in process. So all of these things are, are good things. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> One of the things that uh, came up, Elizabeth Clark, who's a counselor and also runs St. Mary's Place in Kitchener, they had a meeting uh, in downtown Kitchener, and they were mentioning the fact that what they're seeing, what we're seeing here, is exactly what they're seeing there. There's more people showing up on the streets every day. Police are commenting on that. They're seeing it. And the other issue which I want to get into is the behavior of some of the people that they're having difficulties with. They're seeing an upswing in violent behavior in terms of the, uh, in terms of some of the clients they have. They're seeing uh, the same thing with libraries that we have uh, with issues of having to have uh, security guards. Um, and uh, throughout the, uh, the presentation, there was a number of concerns raised about just what was happening. Um, my concern is the behavior we're seeing on the streets. 
in our libraries uh, near our schools, the Gulf Collegiate in particular, that have had a number of incursions that have been recorded. Um, the uh, food bank is having some issues with behaviors. And, and we're getting reports, of course, on the streets uh, from citizens. Um, which then comes down to, okay, we're working in the libraries, putting up security guards. The bridges is, in fact, uh, uh, in an over is being reorganized and certainly is having limitations on what it can do. But it's the street issues. And here's a concern I have. And it's the policing on the streets in Cambridge. And it's, in my opinion, we don't have enough police down here. Uh, and I'm concerned about what's coming this summer in terms of more people probably being on the street. And we need to, in fact, deal with this. And uh, I think we need to get uh, Chief Larkin down here to have a discussion with him. I've been told uh, that uh, we have uh, a less population of officers down here than other detachments and we need to find out why, and I think we need to find out why, uh, what's gonna be done about this upcoming uh, uh, warm season that we're now entering, how we're gonna deal with some of these issues. Overall, I think things are heading in the right direction. We just need to keep on top of it, and we need to work on it. And uh, I uh, certainly feel that the next step for us as a council is to get further information on policing issues, not only this year, but over the next three to five years in terms of all our neighborhoods and all our core areas in terms of increased numbers, I think we're certainly looking at that. Okay. Council Leggett. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, just to add to Mayor Craig's comments, um, speaking with um, a board member and other people as well uh, about the bridges today, and knowing what's happening with the House of Friendship, the House of Friendship is closing and there's gonna be 50 people who will be put out on the streets and that comes from a lack of provincial funding, I believe it is. And um, all the places that are uh, shelters are losing money and not going to be able to handle those that they have been handling in the past. Uh, and I think we're all very happy that the bridge is, is, is um, going to restrict itself to the 78 they're allowed to have plus a 10 that they can put out uh, elsewhere into the community but with everything uh, you know the, the peace staff that work there have, are just kind-hearted people volunteers and staff and and they have a lot of empathy for the, these people and they don't want to be turning them away um, so I, I you know well that they're agreeing that this is gonna happen, um, but I, I have concerns and I think maybe we might wanna consider having the fire department do spot checks uh, just to make sure that this is happening because as we saw uh, previously, there were so many in there, it caused a problem for us. We had such a great influx of people that shouldn't have been in this community. Um, I'm already getting the phone calls um, of what's happening around the community and and this past uh, winter uh, um, and in the fall, there were people living in tents in the alleyways in this city behind people's homes or actually pitching tents in people's backyards. They'd wake up in the morning and find these tents. And the public is relying on us because they don't know where else to go. They're relying on us to make sure that their community is safe. And that includes the laneways behind their houses. Um, we. Uh, you know, we, we rely on private property owners to do their part as well and not to allow this to happen. I recently, um, in my neighborhood, uh, an elderly man who is dying of cancer, very close to death, had somebody from the bridges pitch a tent in his backyard and it was one of the more violent ones who isn't allowed at the bridges anymore. And this man refused to leave and even when the neighbors tried to get him out, he wasn't going to leave. And the elderly gentleman uh, didn't want to force the issue. Uh, he's very much a religious man and he was very, very ill and couldn't handle this on his own. So somebody who is from the bridges as a volunteer actually came up and removed this man. Um, so that was a good story, uh, a good ending to that story. Um, but I have grave concerns as what's gonna happen in the warm weather as Mayor Craig has said here. Uh, and I. 
I know that we do not have bylaws uh, in effect in this city to do with camping on private property other than, or, or the, in, in our city bylaws, we only say that you cannot park, uh, camp on, in our parks. Um, I think that we should be looking at putting a bylaw in place um, and maybe Kelly could look at how we could do this so that when people allow people to pitch tents in their backyards because they have kind souls, that there should be a limitation. And I'm not talking about somebody where they have a sleepover with, with uh, kids in the backyard or whatever. I'm talking about where people will camp for long periods of time and create the kind of problems in a neighborhood that we are going to want to have to answer to. So. Uh, I would like to see if staff would uh, take a look at uh, what we can do about that. Thank you. We'll take that as direction. Council Mann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And through you, just in relation to the policing initiative, uh, uh, Mayor Craig, I, I agree with you. Um, we've, done, we've done policing reports to the city in the past on several, several occasions. And, and I would, uh, I'd be fearful that uh, a report that would come back to us would be, if, it, if it's not the same, it would be less than what has been reported in the past. And I would like to see uh, the call volume, the types of calls, and uh, uh, the staffing levels, and how they compare to years gone by, and how they compare with, uh, with other cities within the municipality, or within the region. And uh, What's the beat coverage? There are a number of things that need to be considered, and I know that the, the police service is stretched to the limit like everybody else when it comes to staffing and demands on staffing, but at the same time, um, uh, there's a need to have the right people uh, patrolling our streets so that they can help people and they can direct people, and, they, and sometimes they provide a service that people don't want, but uh, we need to have them, and uh, they're there to help us, and uh, I think it would be uh, prudent to have uh, the chief and uh, superintendent from the division to come down and to uh, speak to us in relation to those types of things. Councilor Montero. Um, thank you. Through the chair, just to add to what's been said so far, is when I heard that the House of Friendship was closing, I immediately <coughs> became fearful because uh, I'll tell you why, my, my reasonings. Although bridges, the region capped the uh, bridges to 78 people, but that does not mean in the excess go to motels. The thing is, knowing street people, they will gravitate to a place, an institution where they know it will take them, even if there is no room. If the House of Friendship is no longer there, guess where they're going to come? They're going to come to Cambridge because bridges is there. Although the 78 cap is there, but they're all going to be here from the north of the 401, uh, even to the to the motels, because they were looking they're looking for a place such as bridges when there is room. So keep that in mind, because that's coming. It, it, it's unfortunate, but it's coming. The other thing about policing. I'll wait to make my comments until the chief and uh, deputy and the superintendent from Cambridge come here because I know the numbers, what they are, and the numbers are still the same when I last in, left in 2010. Um, until then, I'll keep my comments about the, the, the numbers until they come here and I'll question them. But it is an issue that one beat officer that we have here from eight to four is certainly not sufficient. Uh, we have to have longer hours, such as in evening hours, which is what a lot of people are fearful, is the evening hours, especially in the summertime now, people, uh, they want to be out and about till it only gets dark after nine o'clock. Uh, it, it, it's going to be an issue, and, and I'm hoping that this will be addressed not on an eight to four officer down here. So, but I'll make those comments up. But the food for thought is the uh, closing of the House of Friendship. I'll guarantee you we'll go, we're going to feel the influx. Councillor Wolf. 
Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, well, I have some better news, and that's at our last library board meeting. Uh, they, it was indicated there was a report that the number of incidences, incidents and problems that they were having at uh, ID Exchange, the Queen Street one, has gone down markedly since they brought in um, security guards for 20 hours a week. Uh, there are cameras, uh, and uh, they also train their staff to deal with um, mentally ill and um, uh, basically troubled people and how to approach them. They also had a um, um, student, uh, a social work student who was on, was there for four months or five months, and uh, she was very good with um, dealing with patrons. And they instituted a um, sort of library card that was good for the computers, which would have your name on it when you swiped, as opposed to just a guest pass, so they could tell if you, they, if you're allowed to, let's say, be on an hour a day, they knew that someone had been on the computers an hour a day and they could stop them. But it was um, interesting to hear the various things, measures they had taken and the fact that they were being successful. So, um, uh, again, uh, then the other, in terms of policing, our bicycle patrols uh, begin in May and um, they have been very effective in the past. So um, I'm hopeful that uh, some of these things will, um, will also help. Um, I'm also realistic that, uh, you know, if we don't house any more than 78 people without homes, those people will have to go someplace. And that's without an influx from uh, Kitchener. That's just to look after our own Cambridge people. So uh, I think it's, a, it's something we have to continue to work on, but I'm glad to see that we all are having some success. Mayor Craig? Well, just to let me go back, there is successes at the bridges, and I think that's taking place now. I don't want it to be looked upon as simply a negative value. Um, but in, in, in terms of uh, House of Friendship, it's not closing, it's the overflow church they had that had up to 50 people that were allowed to stay overnight is closed as of yesterday. So that's what's closing. And I come back to the policing, and I, I have to raise this publicly because I'm not happy with it. Um, I think that, uh, like I said, the numbers are not comparable with other detachments. And secondly, you know, where I'm hearing complaints about officers not wanting to do overtime because they're exhausted and that's what it's coming down to so we need to deal with this issue across the region and in particular in cambridge and we need a bigger we need more of a presence in the community that's a good good point mayor craig i've heard some concerns too about the detachment not having as many as the other ones and how some of the ones doing drugs they come up here from toronto and then they're the, when they send back up from Waterloo or something and they come back down to Cambridge, they're back on the highway going back to the city. I've heard rumors about that which should be looked into and I think it falls into that problem. Councilor Mann, did you have any new business? I know, I think you had mentioned that. I'll let you raise that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just one item and I know everybody around the horseshoe is, is probably tired of this but I'm going to speak to it anyhow and it's Preston Springs. Uh, Preston Springs has been vacant for approximately 20 years and uh, virtually every window in the building is broken and a haphazard attempt has been made at securing the building on several occasions and uh, we see different shapes and sizes of plywood against windows and uh, boards against windows and attempts to lock the door at, that uh, are pried open and, uh, and, and it's just, it's, it's really discouraging because thousands of people drive by that building on a regular basis every day. You know, it's the old broken window syndrome. When you see a broken window and it's not fixed and you see it day after day after day, you don't see it after that. And a lot of people don't see the gem of Preston in such a dilapidated state because they see it that way day after day after day. And I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's become an eyesore and uh, like I say, it was once the gem of Preston. And I think the owner is, uh, obviously doesn't care. And eight months ago, he uh, gave us a tour through the building. 
and he said that he had a plan. And he said the plan was going to be forthcoming and that something was going to be done with the building. Well, nothing's happened. And uh, he doesn't respond until somebody complains about the status of the building. And, and we could be complaining every day. I know staff are continually asked to secure the building and um, attempts are made to do that. And uh, I, would like, I would like direction, if we could get it, that staff would secure it and properly secure it and bill back to the owner and secure it in a way that would make it aesthetically more appealing than what it is because when you drive up to that intersection and you stop at a red light, all you see is a building that is uh, in deplorable state. And uh, I think the owner has a responsibility to make sure it's secure and if he's not going to do it, then we can do it in a way that we can build back and make sure that uh, uh, it looks reasonable for the, for the type of building that it is. I know that Mr. Dyke wants to speak to that, and I'm happy to hear what he has to say. I'll let Hardy, uh, unless you wanted to say something, Gary. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. All I was going to do is direct to Mr. Hardy, uh, Mr. Hardy, Mr. Bromberg, because I believe uh, his team is uh, are working towards this goal. Yeah, um, Dennis Purcell, our chief building official, and uh, he's also responsible for our bylaw enforcement. Um, he's been putting a plan together, and uh, Nicole Papke, our manager of bylaw enforcement, they've been putting a plan together and have had some discussions with the owner about uh, securing the property. Uh, what I can do is I can provide council with, with an update at our next council meeting with, with uh, those plans if, if the general committee so wishes. So, Councilman, you've got the adjournment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have, and uh, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Adshade, that the meeting does adjourn now at 9.15 p.m. Thank you, everyone. Meeting adjourned.